Toto. Um, it's lovely to have had the opening from Corbyn and uh, and the settling of us with the karakia and and to hear from Nanaya and so on. So it is lovely to be together. And these are just some administrative things that I thought it would be great if you could all take account of. So Kirsty, thank you for being with us because without you it would be even more of a rush. So um, just before we get going properly, um, I just want to acknowledge that we're all in lockdown. And it does make us think about what we really care about, I think of it. And if you'd like to doodle on your bit of paper about the things that have sort of come up during, during lockdown as to what really matters to you, what, what is it that keeps you going under these circumstances? And then if you could think of one word that you could share of something that you're grateful for. And I'm going to get you to uh, well, well, we'll just call them out and, and Kirsty's going to type them into a page and we'll have a look at it when we've all had a chance to share. If uh, you just, uh, I think it's probably best if you just call them out and Kirsty, you type. And if we're going too fast, please just put your hand up like this. And if you haven't had a chance to say something and you want to, please um, uh, do say uh, what you've, what I haven't got you all up here at, until right now, but I can't really, I can only see a few of you at the time, unfortunately. That's how it is. It says 10 people have entered the waiting room on my screen. So mm -hmm. I haven't- It's okay, got, we've got a message there for them. Okay. So um, they know how to do stuff, do they? And we'll just get cracking. Okay. So um, uh, I think that's what we'll have to do. I, I, I don't know quite how to do this because it wasn't supposed to be so many people, but never mind. Um, how do you think would be best? Just call out the names. So we're going to go into the whiteboard now? Yes, please. And if you call out the names and Kirsty will write them up and just the things that you really care about. And while you're doodling, if you could also just write down a special place, we'll use that later. So one word now out loud, you can doodle as much as you like, and please take a note of a special place. Your home, go for it. Uh, connection. Connection. Just go people, one word, I'll put mountains. Nicole, did you have something? Yeah, I'd say volunteering. Right. Volunteering. Elizabeth? Oh, mine was connection. Oh, sorry. Lydia? Um, I'm grateful for my friends. Friends. Oh, yeah. Matthew, just go, people. No? Well, if there's no more, we'll just leave that like that. Thank you, um, Kirsty. Um, it's obviously something that is trickier on online. So we'll just go back to the screen and um, carry on. So this is really about starting the session with the thinking about well-being. We've heard the minister refer to the well-being budget that's coming up. And it does require on us to tell our stories. And if we think of the things that really matter, um, as that some of us have been able to just quickly share. Um, you can think about how that is a set of values, if you like, just briefly. And so what I'd like to do is to take a quick side step into the difference between value and price. If we go back and we try and put a quick dollar value on some of those things that were mentioned, it's tricky. So there's a difference between value and price, and that's a fairly obvious sort of a statement, I know. But the United Nations, and this is a United Nations Development Summit, has been uh, running countries since the first Second World War on the basis of assessing their success through a dollar value system, the gross domestic product, these, the gross national product, that kind of thing. And so when a country does a lot of, has a lot of earthquakes, uh, the GDP for New Zealand uh, increases, and that's considered to be a good thing. So it's kind of a, an odd system. 
And that United Nations system of national accounts is been what's driven the assessing of the success of countries. And so this is um, a session uh, with you, hopefully, not by me, <laughs> um, but with you about what we can do to see the treaty as a framework, which can actually give us a holistic framework for looking at the future. And that's for all of us, not just for Māori, it's for all of us. And the, the, in the United Nations system, there is a new declaration, one of the sets of rights that has come up. This is all on our website if you want to have a look at the detail. But that's, that set of rights is uh, really important uh, to help us understand what it means to work with the treaty in an international context. So um, <clears throat> that um, holistic approach is uh, the way we talk about it in Network Waitangi because we all have language for what we do. Um, is we talk about relationships between tangata whenua, acknowledging the indigenous status of Māori, and everyone else. And the language we use for everyone else is tangata tiriti. And we have a very clear multicultural approach, treaty-based multicultural, where the indigenous status of tangata whenua is understood. And so... Um, that's really just scene setting sort of languagey stuff. Has anybody got any questions about that bit? Do indicate, and I don't know if you can see all the hands, can you? Um, we are getting a few more um, joining on the screen. I'm not sure why they were delayed, but they're coming through. Right. Um, so so if people will have to use the reaction button if they don't have their video on. Okay, so if you if you want to raise a question, please put that little yellow hand up, uh, or if I can see you. In fact, it's probably better if everybody uses the little yellow hand, which is down the bottom in the reaction screen. It's the for me, it's the third one from the right, but your screen might be bigger than mine. So um, if there aren't any questions about the language that we're using, which is basically what that was about. I'd like to move on um, and uh, just a little bit more about the multicultural side of things. I mean, there's wonderful resources uh, around. If you want to get details, do email us. Um, but these are the ways of, that are being published in terms of working with people from different ethnicities. Multiculturalism, of course, is a much bigger thing than just ethnicity. And it, it, look, in the United Nations language, they talk about um, gender rights, worker rights, all of these sort of things. And each of these uh, collectives has their own culture. And so it's helpful to think about multicultural in the broad sense of that term, not just multi-ethnic. Um, multi-ethnic is really important. We have a huge number of languages spoken in New Zealand. I think it's 167 of the last latest count. So this is about a treaty-based multicultural future where tangata whenua are understood as the indigenous people of this country. And uh, one last thing about that side of things is that um, the word indigenous is, is often difficult to define. The nicest one I've ever had it shared with me is that it's the language of the first people who named the land. And so the, the language necessarily connects to what Americans call nature. So that's a helpful way of perhaps looking at an indigenous language. And we're very lucky in New Zealand to have this uh, now, at last, an official language. So we'll just move on to the next uh, uh, screen if there's no questions. So, um, what I've done is to, ooh, what we've done is to have a bit of a look at what real matter, really matters. We'll come back to the special place. We all need to tell our stories to get to the bottom of understanding what we all care about. And we're, in this country, we take account of the indigeneity of Tangata Benua. Moving on. Um, just a, a, the, the, the emphasis in this, the emphasis in this little sharing with you is um, to help people come to terms with the things that have been only recently talked about in New Zealand. 
we had called the session understanding the treaty in 2021 quite deliberately because there's a lot of new information that's coming forward about the pre-treaty story and a lot of people don't know about the pre-treaty story there's a lot of resources on our network Waitangi website for you to look at in detail but for example I don't know whether you all know about the establishment of Tawaka Mininga in 1808. I think that was the, it's the council that eventually signed the, uh, that brought everybody together, that led to the, the groups of people that participated in the 1835 statement and in the treaty. But Tawaka Mininga really started in the, in the late 1700s when a couple of Maori boys were kidnapped in the Hauraki Gulf and taken to Norfolk Island. And um, the governor from Sydney called by, because Norfolk Island was at that stage part of Australia, still is, and um, uh, told the, the people and the businessmen who'd done that to try and, they wanted the, the Maori people to teach them how to make flax into the South Pacific flax into linen, because the Irish process wasn't working. But uh, basically, Governor King said, no, no, that's not a British thing to do. Take them home. And Tapahi, their uncle, went to Sydney. And in 1805, um, he got a medal for the kind of for building relationships from Governor King. And so this, this long story of contact is, is something we don't know a lot about. Down south in Kaitahu, uh, in 1810, there was a lot of um, conversation about trading potatoes and uh, steel and so on. So, I mean, there's a lot, there's a big story pre-treaty in this country. There's also a story pre-treaty in Britain. Uh, and the Clapham sect is just one group of people that I've only recently explored. And that was Wilberforce and the anti-slavery people who were um, really talking from the late 1700s again about the injustice that had been caused by colonization. And so those, those things were going, those conversations were going on and the Christian Missionary Society, the Church Missionary Society, um, sort of inherited a lot of the Clapham sect's thinking. So basically when it comes to Tangata Whenua taking responsibility for saying, okay, we're on the international stage. There was a declaration in 1835, often referred to as the Declaration of Independence. Again, this is on the, the website. Um, in Māori, it's the Declaration of Rangatiratanga. And that 1835 statement um, uh, was followed five years later because in 1835, Māori had put themselves on the international stage. They'd been recognised as having title to the soil and to sovereignty by King William. And that was followed up in 1840 because what Māori was saying was, Actually, we're sick of controlling the bad boys from the other side, because they mainly were bad boys from the other side of the Tasman when they'd come to live in New Zealand, and also the misbehaviour of some of the commercial organisations like the New Zealand Company, who were coming in and helping themselves to land in the Tawny Beach, for example, 1840, uh, Samuel Parnell was not having a bar of being bossed around by the uh, people on the boat from England who wanted to re-establish the pecking order in New Zealand. Um, he just stood on the beach and said, eight hours work, eight hours play, eight hours sleep, and eight bob a day. Thank you. So that was the end of um, the, 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 the sort of imposition of an unfettered uh, class society in New Zealand. Um, so there were things going on in the British world and there were things going on in the Māori world and this, this treaty was a relationship that formed uh, as a result of that history and I'm not going to go into the detail of that but if anybody's got questions please do chip in. Um, so the, the big thing I wanted to point out in 2021, like the, the need for us all to learn more about the pre-treaty history, is that uh, we also need to understand that the only text there on February 6th, 1840 was the text in Te Reo. And fortunately, 
we have got a lot of development very recently since 2017 uh, in the social context, uh, which means we're no longer reliant on substitutes of the treaty. We can actually now be really clear that the authoritative uh, text in terms of the government's view, it's always been the view from Network Waitangi or Tautahi, and it's always been the view from Tanga Te Whenua. But now we have a government that is committed to the original promise of the treaty. And there's a lot of specific information about changes in the cabinet manual if you're interested and about changes in the Public Service Act that we heard Nanaya Mahuta refer to and so on, on our website and happy to respond if you have those sorts of questions. However, we probably all know about the fact that colonization happened and the treaty was dishonored. I don't think that's new news to people, but what might be new news is the understanding of the doctrine of discovery. If you don't know about that, it's a very important thing to explore because it still underpins our legal system basically and gives rise to the kinds of decisions that we make uh, when push comes to shove uh, with, with decision-making. And happy to talk about that in detail with any of you who want to communicate. And we've got a handout about it and we have got a, a, a further handout from uh, Professor David Williams at Auckland University um, about the uh, right of discovery. So if people are saying to you, oh, the doctrine of discovery wasn't applied and the right of discovery was, none of that is, is quite accurate. And so it's a bit of a detailed thing, but it is really important to understand it. For those of you who know nothing about it, basically the doctrine of discovery was the idea that the Pope had, which that if in, um, when you go, when you're an explorer, from the Western world and you go and dis discover some other country, you are entitled to regard the land as empty unless the people in it are of the Christian faith. And that's really how Australia was, was terra nullius an empty land until 1964, when the Mabo Declaration was um, declared and Aboriginal Australians and Torres Strait Islanders became human. Before that, they were fauna and they could be shot for sport. So that's as close as it got to us in Australia. But um, those things are really sort of all new, new, new aspects for a lot of New Zealanders. And we have a lot of lovely detail if you want it. So that's the next little bit of this session together. Is there anything that anybody would like to raise at this point? Well, should we put her on? Uh, just to say, maybe if you want to put your questions in the chat, um, I'm monitoring that and I can speak on your behalf if you wish. Thank you, Kirsty. So what is the treaty? having said that there's some new bits that need to be understood before we can bring ourselves up to 2017 speed. Um, well, the treaty was, an in, and still is, an invitation from Tangata Whenua to everyone else to belong here, if it's honoured, of course. And it's also the basis of a developing way of being of all of us in this country. We often hear visitors talk about the the, the way it's different visiting New Zealand than visiting other countries. And also of the way we belong in this country as a nation state. So it's, an, it's, a, it's a really holistic way of looking at our future. And Paul Hunt, the Human Rights Commissioner recently spoke to our, actually to our annual general meeting here in Christchurch. And he spoke about how this, this commitment to the treaty and the relationship with the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights is a very interesting one because it requires us to think holistically about human rights. And so um, that's another part of uh, this, this approach. And it brings us back to that sharing of what you felt uh, in lockdown about what you really care about 
and the special places that you have. And this work is values-based, not price-based, but values-based. And it's also connected to the place where you live or you visit. And I've popped the word hapu in there beside place because this understanding in this country that kaitiakitanga and mana whenua, who are the local tangata whenua, have a particularly important role because the treaty was signed by hapu. The rangatira were the, who declared rangatira tanga were the rangatira of the hapu. And this was what brings me to the role of the Waitangi Tribunal, which is again something that people not necessarily understand. Um, if I got you metaphorically to detach from your bits of paper where you've written your special place, somewhere where you like to go on holiday, I don't know, somewhere where you just breathe better, um, I love sitting by a stream in Arthur's Pass. It's a very special place for me. Um, so if, I, if, you can, if you can imagine that I took a little koha basket and I asked you to put all those special pieces, places metaphorically in my koha basket. And then I went away and I took those pieces of paper out and I ripped them up and I chucked them out into a nor'wester and let them blow away or into a big southerly wind, let them blow away. And then 170 years later, I come along and I say to you, yeah, if you can find those bits of paper and sellotape them back together and prove them that, that you, they're, your, they're yours, and make sure that everybody in your connect with connected with you is on the same page. That this this still applies. This is still what matters to you. Then you can bring that piece of paper, provided you can prove it's yours, to the Waitangi Tribunal, and we'll listen to your story. And if we think you've proved it then we'll make some recommendations to the government. The government doesn't have to take any notice of our recommendations, but we will make some recommendations to the government. And if the government agrees to recompense you, then you'll get a, a, a recompense in terms of the dollar terms in a, at about 1.7% of what you've proved to us, it's owed to you in dollar terms. It's not exactly a full and final settlement, which is what Māori have to agree to when they take the final, uh, when they take the so-called treaty settlement process, and it's called a full and final settlement. So there are still leftover difficulties in relation to the Waitangi Tribunal. So just to recap, we have a look at what what is what is valued by us. We are all aware of our stories. We, we bring that information together with new information that we need to ferret out. And then what we can do is revisit the fact that we're all invited, not just Māori. In fact, Māori don't really need the treaty. They actually tongue it to whenua. It's the rest of us that need it. Um, and th so those of us who are tangata tiriti can come together and start to think about what it means to live in this country with any sense of justice. And so uh, we need to think that it's values-based and it's place-based, and we need to acknowledge the leftovers from colonization. And in fact, somebody said, you know, have the colonizers left? Well, probably not. And what we are uh, at the moment thinking brings quite a good focus to this work is that, I'm trying to move that screen, but it won't move, sorry. Um, the challenge is not to focus on ethnicity so much, 
to make sure that we're not excluding people of different ethnicities because Pakeha people, European people have had the whole dominant thing uh, their way. But to challenge, the challenge is not to focus on ethnicity, but on taking responsibility for a shift in the type of decision-making that we get up to. And Moana Jackson is calling it a shift from majoritarianism alone, you know, waiting long enough for the conversation to get to a point where you know that seven people think this and six people think that. So the seven people are going to win and the six people are going to lose and we're going to move on. And not to do that. A lot of groups are actually learning to work by consensus and those different forms of politics meaning decision making i'm not talking about party politics and we need to be in right relationship with tangata whenua because it was their invitation for us to come in and also with each other and with nature as americans call it so and what what we're suggesting is that we need to do some learning about what it means to be an ally of tangata whenua and in understanding the roles and setting an agenda so that all of us can participate in a multicultural treaty-based future where the indigenous status of Tangata Whenua is understood. Big mouthful. But that's the sort of angle that we're taking. And I'm wondering whether we might sort of agree with some of that stuff in red, because what I'd love to do is to amend that and gift it to the Sustainable Development Goals Summit as a kind of a little thing to do about the treaty in 2021. So we'll come back to this and you could have a think about this if you would. Before we go on, Catherine, I've got a question here. Here, aha te tinga tinganga or te tangata te riti. Um, here, yeah. Catherine, here, aha te tikanga o te o nga te tangata te riti. Ko wai Kawai tera. Tawiwi, Pākehā. Who was it? Who everyone. are the to, to everyone, everyone else? Every, well, everyone else that isn't everyone, farming. Everyone, everyone else. I mean, the Tawiwi word is difficult, and I, you know, it's tricky to get into detail, but Tawiwi is used differently by people depending on which hapu they're part of. Because for people who aren't aware, a lot of hapu who consider, who, who I don't want to use names, but who have visitors from other parts of this country, um, consider them toiwi because they right. come into Mana Whenua country, you know. So yeah. language is difficult. It was Edward Dury who suggested that we use Tangata Tiriti. That's from whom we got the, the message. Okay. Somebody said to him, a, a Chinese a person, he happened to be a professor at, at Lincoln University, but that wasn't important. What was important was that he was of Chinese descent. Yes. And he said, look, you've talked about Māori and Pākehā, that makes yes. you feel really excluded. And Eddie Dury said, well, you're Tangata Tiriti. You're the people of the treaty. Right. So right. that's where that is that that's really what you were asking, was it? Yes, that, that's what I was asking. So so if we've got Maori who are who are the um the uh instigators, if you will, you know, that the, the yeah. mana whenua. Well, yes, tangata whenua, mana whenua, it's tangata, whenua, yeah. you know. Yes, yes, um, I do. But let's and look at everybody the, else. Let's who's look coming. at the slide because this might help. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Thank you. Any other questions, Kirsty? Not yet. Not yet? No, okay. I do encourage questions in the chat if you need to. And we'll come back to this if you, this red bit in red in a, in a little while. But just before we do, um, this is the, this is what uh, I, I just wanted to share next, um, which is that a treaty based way of working in organizations, because most of us are not running the government, you know, we, we don't have that, that at our fingertips. So, it just at a practical level, treaty-based way of working as Toiwi allies, to use that term, is to build relationships and show solidarity under the guidance of those that we have relationships with, with whoever they are. They might be Māori, they might not be Māori, but at least we can get together with Tangata Tiriti and sort our angles out, and then we're in a much better space to have a proper connection with the Tangata Whenua wherever they are. 
because it does depend on where you're working as to how this relationship develops. But the process is not majoritarianism. It's actually saying, okay, where's the tangata whenua voice? Where's our voice being tangata tiriti, using that term? And um, it, 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 I'm focusing this whole thing on tangata tiriti because that was what I was asked to do by the organizers. Um, but, you know, tangata tiriti, tangata whenua, this, this is the kind, these are the voices in this country at the moment. And once we get the voices, we can begin to find what we can do in common and what we still need to do separately. So that's just a picture. Again, this is on our website. Um, and so when we've got the picture, we still have a discipline to apply though. And this is really important, this last part. Basically, you've, I've mentioned about the importance of the pre-treaty story and I'm stroking my arm like this because I think of my arm as the blood supply to the treaty is as imaged by my hand. And I think of the declaration of 1835 of Rangatiratanga, the form of authority that was there to frame the treaty as being a way to think about this work. Know the pre-treaty story, know that it's all in the framework of that form of authority of rangatiratanga, which is a very special form of authority and it ain't majoritarianism. And then doing treaty work requires us to do the whole of the treaty, not just bits and pieces of it. And the cabinet manual was recently updated in 2019 to require cabinet ministers and the government to take the treaty as a whole. And it also states in the cabinet manual that this process may place constraints on majority decision-making. So we're not talking outside government policy at the moment on this matter. It's really amazing. And so here we've got this pre-treaty story to learn, getting much clearer about what Māori are regaining and retaining as rangatiratanga, which is a big job. And then those of us who are tangata tiriti, we can get the roadblocks out of the way so that Māori can do that work. But our job is to implement the treaty as tangata tiriti. And I think of it as these five parts with the preamble, and the fourth article. The fourth article was written last, spoken first. And that's why one person said, actually, if you bring your thumb and your little finger together as the preamble and the uh, fourth article, they actually really should be connected. So they suggested that the image could be this one with the peaceful, inclusive future and taking account of everybody's spirituality, upholding the feathers of peace, which for those of you who know the Parihaka story is an, one other really important part of our history. It astounds me that people know about Gandhi, but they don't know about Te Whiti Arongamai, because Gandhi learned so much of his passive so-called passive resistance, I call it non-violent action, uh, from um, Te Whiti. And so here we have this treaty as a holistic thing, connecting a peaceful, really the treaty is a covenant of peace. And it does acknowledge everybody's spirituality. And it would never have gone ahead if the, that acknowledgement hadn't been made of Māori custom alike as well. And so the articles of the treaty are Article 1, setting up the sort of government that fits with the treaty. Article 2, Māori weren't rolling over like dead ants and saying they were giving everything up. They were holding on to what they'd always had. So Rangatiratanga, declared in 1835, stays put. 
Article 3 was saying, you know what happens to those indigenous people in Australia? We've seen it. We've been to Sydney. A thousand of us traveled to Europe before the treaty was even signed. We're not having a bar of that here. Māori are going to be able to have access to everything that the newbies set up. So the University of Canterbury, Lincoln University, the hospitals, the schools, the everythings. Māori have equal access. They also have the responsibility of upholding Tinoranga Teratanga. So they've effectively got two jobs. So in terms of action, apart from coming back with something that we want to take to the, to, to the sustainable development goals, it's really about what are, we, what are each of us going to do next? That's what these red bits at the bottom are designed to encourage us to think about. You know, what are you, as a result of doing this little workshop, what are you going to do? What are you going to do about it? And very importantly, who are you going to do it with? Because this isn't an individual pursuit. This is something you do with your work colleagues or your family. That's some of the hardest place to work. So this is who are you going to do it with? And very importantly, who's going to check up to know that it's done? Because it's really easy to have intentions and not have time to do anything about it. So that's my little presentation. You're happy to, I'm happy to share it with any of you who want it. Please email me. And what I'd like to do is to go back to this expression and see if we can together uh, make it make it change it say something different what would you like to say what I've tried to summarize here is to address what a lot of people um, come up with when it's the treaty is talked about that it's it's really about you know, Maoris, or it's really about uh, uh, the fact that, that Pākehā people have dominated the, the whole conversation, which is true. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and it needs to be much more multicultural. All of that's really true. Uh, but what we don't want is to have substitutes for the treaty, because for so long we've had substitutes for the treaty. We've had treaty principles, or we've had this, or we've had that. Why not stick with the five aspects of the treaty and apply that? So that's that's really what um, uh, is is sort of like the goal, you know. So please do chip in, raise issues, suggest things. <laughs> Elizabeth Grace has raised a hand. Where's Elizabeth? Hi. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the presentation. It was really eye-opening. Um, when you were talking about the treaty and how it can be used, like not just domestically, but internationally in the framework of SDGs, um, how exactly do you think, and how do you see this actually happening? Because I've found that when researching like the international community, they like to talk a big game about um, value-based approaches, but when it actually comes down to it, money seems to always come out on top and that's quite demoralizing. Um, and I was wondering if you have any thoughts or um, opinions on this that you could share. Well, I think international, I mean, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I'm, I'm not just a, you know, a citizen like you, but um, my reaction is to say that I think it's governments that actually can make a difference there. And so what I'm, what we're doing in Network Waitangi or Totahi is really supporting the wellbeing budget and the um, upholding of the four wellbeings in the Local Government Act. Those are two instruments that citizens have to organize around, you know, um, and this is the methodology that we that we use because, and so the only thing I can think of as a 
brief response is to find other people who are interested in these things and network Waitangi or Tatahi declares its interest straight away to you. You know, we're happy to help. Um, and so what we what what I think is is as a way to do this is to find the other people and at the moment the Human Rights Commission has got something called a, a program against racism and the Human Rights Commission is doing a lot of work on liaising with Maori um, in relation to the two recent reports that have come out I have mentioned them briefly somewhere um, let me find them. Here we go. As Toiwi allies, we can build relationships and solve the blah, with whom we built relationships and as reviewed in Matiki Mai and Hei Pua Pua reports. Now, have you looked at those, Elizabeth? They're both on our website. And Hei Pua Pua is the one that's been in the media recently, but with, with, the, with, the, with Judith Collins uh, commenting. Um, but Matiki Mai is a report that was done by the Iwi Leaders Forum, or under their, um, uh, they initiated it, and it's a report on how we could have a treaty-based future and the way to get there. And so that's direct from the Iwi Leaders Forum, and He Pua Pua is the report that was picking up the recommendations in Matiki Mai in consideration of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and seeing how Matiki Mai and the UN Declaration mesh to provide some suggestions as to what the government might do about implementing the, the UN Declaration in New Zealand. Because an answer, not an answer, but a sort of a response to your question is that instead of us working internationally, we take the international instruments and make them work here. That's the model that has worked for New Zealand in the past with the nuclear free movement and other things. I mean, the stand that we took with the, with the nuclear free, um, on our the nuclear free position that we took was eventually taken to the world court and we've now got a United Nations declaration on the ban of the proliferation of nu nuclear weapons. You know, um, mm -hmm. I'm just looking at these models of how, how have we influenced the international stage? And so kind of like by doing things like this, New Zealand is really trying to lead the way and kind of show the rest of the world how it's done, basically. Um, that's right. We've always, that's been our foreign policy. You heard Nanaya Mahuta talk about, you know, how we we also need to bring a Pacific lens to this. And um, the small island states, you know, we're not a small island state in terms of in, in terms of United Nations language, but at least we can be an ally of them. And I think that general principle of learning the Western nations, powerful nations, need to learn to live better as allies you know, and let go of power in that old sense of the word and, and find a way to develop new ways of working. And I think this treaty relationships framework is a new way of working. You know, if we sort of say, hang on a minute, you know, we can't make a decision here. Where's the Māori voice? You know, that's the sort of thing. Awesome. Thank you for that. We've got a few more minutes. Um, how are people feeling about coming up with something to share back to the bigger group? Just point out that Kelly has shared some links in the chat for people to look at. In the chat? Yeah. So we have to, how do I get out of this? Because I can't see the chat. You, you need to um, either hover over the bottom of your screen to activate the chat. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, oh. Who has, or oh, Kelly has shared the, the Mataki Mai? Yeah, kia ora. I have just shared He Pua Pua, Mataki Mai, and the um, Human Rights Commission's um, um, current uh, National Action Plan Against Racism. Great. And also there's, there's copies of them on the Network Waitangi website if you just want to click and collect. <laughs> Sorry, um, there's a question here from someone. Um, I can't see your name, sorry. 
Who has got their hand up? Unmute yourself, love. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yep. yep. Is it just me who's got their hand up? I think so. Yes. Okay. So if um, Tonga and Tetiti are the majority population in the country, yep. how do we then shift the majoritarian attitude of decision making to a hui? A hui hui type thing, you know. How do we how do we shift our attitudes? Because because traditionally, um, well, in New Zealand, our our attitude has been towards you know a majority rules thing, as you discussed. So how do we shift that if the majority of the population is Tangata Tiriti rather than Tangata Whenua? Well, I suppose the majority of Tangata Tiriti could become supportive. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's why we use this language of tangata tiriti, yeah. you know, um, to provide a sort of a collective consciousness, if you like, of behaving mm. in this way, um, mm. because otherwise people think of themselves as individual citizens, and, and of course we are all individual citizens, it's not an either or thing, it's a both and thing. Yeah. Um, and um, so I, I think that my only response to that is to begin to talk about uh, the, the possibility that we can work together as Tangata Tiriti, applying that lens to this way of working and um, making sure that we don't substitute the treaty with simplistic definitions. For example, it's not surprising that the health sector has been really focused on equity. Yeah. And, and I mean, don't get me wrong, equity is really important, but as thinking that that's all there is to treaty work, it isn't all, all it is. And what we're saying is that there's been, um, you see, I don't know if people know, but in 2006, the, the prime minister, I understand, instructed that all references to the treaty in health policy be removed, not, not from the legislation, but all references in health policy be removed to the treaty and substituted with the word equity for Maori. You know, so that was the idea that we put a focus on equity for Maori, not equity with Maori or equity by Maori, but equity for Maori, um, then that would solve the problem. Uh, of the treaty, but it, it's sort of like it was a substitute. So what we're saying is let's not do the substitutes yeah. and from there. Okay, thank you. Catherine, Rob, Rob Clark has said, um, could it be helping Tangata Tiriti to identify when they are being racist? Could it be in helping? Uh, could yeah. it be in helping or help? Do you mean, could this, could, yeah. I, could I suggest how to, Help Tangata Tiriti realise when they're being racist. I'm just not quite clear what the question is. I think it, I was, think it was in relation to my question when oh. I was saying about how we could make a shift oh. from authoritarianism. And could it? I think that 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 was a reaction to my question. Oh. Could it be in helping yes. people realise when they're being racist? Yeah. Thank oh, sorry. Yes, Thank you, Rob. Yep. So given that we've got a, a little bit of time, um, but what five minutes, Kirsty? Have we? Um, no, we've got another uh, 20 minutes, 15 oh. to 20 minutes. Oh, that's excellent. So we can really worry this, guys. <laughs> um, so what, what, what would be helpful to share, do you think, with the, um, with the group? I mean, with, with the powers that be of the organisers of this forum. What they would like is something from this little group of people about um, how to better understand the treaty in 2021 or something like that. You know, I mean, could we, what, what is it that surprised you about this presentation? Maybe we could take a few notes on the board. Um, uh, uh, Chris, would that be an option if we get a clear? Quite happy to brainstorm on the whiteboard. Yep. Anybody feel that's not a good way forward? Yes, that's a good way forward. Okay. Yep. Okay. Let's go to the to the whiteboard, Kirsty. Okay. So, do we want to keep this one? No, I think we could clear that. Thank you. 
Okay, start as long as we remember that sort of difference between values and price and how hard that is to clear it out of the, the way. Um, so what, what, let's take a, let's get a few ideas as to what surprised you? What, 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 what is the message for the, for the wider group about the treaty in 2021? Can anybody think of something? Otherwise, I'm going to have to write something and I don't want to um, do it on my own. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to contribute something. I wonder if there's a, um, a a general lack of knowledge about what it is in the different articles. Yes. Okay. So actually promote the authoritative text of the treaty. This or is the, 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 princ the, the, the principles of the treaty in the, the essence of each of the articles rather than the entire thing. Um, <laughs> because it's quite straightforward in, in in its but it's also um i don't i don't think it's very well understood in the general public no you mean that you, when you talk about the, the authoritative text you're meaning the, the the those five bits not not the not the substitutes of the treaty are, are you meaning that well, what i mean is the first part to understanding um, a document of such import is knowing about the principles of the treaty and each of those articles. Yes, I think knowing the that they are actually exist and what they are about in in simple terms is um, a starting point. <laughs> yes, and I think that um, the simple terms is something I agree with. The difficulty with the word principles is that it now has a meaning in law which has become a real obstacle to, to getting the authoritative text, the, the Tereo text of the treaty acknowledged. Because this is, this is one of the difficulties that we have with the, the way the treaty is perceived in wider society. A lot of people simply don't know that the only one there on February the 6th, 1840, was the text in Tereo. And they don't know that the government has actually uh, committed itself to the original promise of the treaty, which is that one. That is a really big step for New Zealand to have taken in 2017. <coughs> so. Well, it seems like there's a, sorry. Sorry, Elizabeth had her hand up. Mm. I was going to say, I think, um, building on what Rob was saying, I think the tertiary educations really need to step up their game in educating us further on the treaty because I have already finished one qualification in international relations and I've taken courses on New Zealand um, policy, like foreign policy and the Treaty of Waitangi and the treaty, I didn't even know there was a difference um, until this year when I... Um, went and actually sought it out because I was interested in a you know, stuff article and that shouldn't happen. And especially now that the Tertiary Training Act and this, some of you might be interested to download the detail of this thing called Recent Changes in the Social Context. It's one of the handouts on our resources page which documents these changes that have happened since these something called the speech from the throne which was the government statement in 2017 there's a lot that's happened and <clears throat> the change to the education and training act is that they that the tertiary education now has to uphold to tiriti or waitangi the text in tereo and the tertiary education commission has taken all references to the principles out of their documents so they no longer talk about the treaty principles, they talk about te tiriti o waitangi, meaning the text in te reo. And that's now in a legislative requirement for tertiary education. So that, that new stuff might be something that we should profile with the wider group for the sustainable development goals. Maybe that's the key useful document. I'm just trying to look for something that from your guidance, which would we could share that would be practical for people. Schools are, um, the Ministry of Education recently asked if they could make a link to our Network Waitangi website for school teachers, because they said it's 
better and more well resourced than the Ministry of Culture and Heritage one on the treaty is. So that was a nice little um, accolade for us, but it is also important that ordinary people doing the work access that stuff. So it's sitting there for use. And so we could perhaps publicize that availability because the detail of the Education and Training Act is specified, the legal parts of it is specified on, on that act, on that uh, handout too. So Bob, Rob, you had one other follow-up question and then Annie. Um, it's not a question, it was just a wondering really. Um, um, I was recently, uh, I came across a discussion on LinkedIn recently that involved a couple of individuals being very racist in their responses. And um, there's been a subsequent conversation around, um, there doesn't appear to be any uh, requirement for in governance of New Zealand companies to uphold te tiriti or waitangi. And so um, there doesn't appear to be any kind of mechanism for shareholders, for example, to hold directors to account if their behaviours are racist or seem to be racist or not well, inclusive. Other than, I mean, the only thing would be the, 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 the work of the Human Rights Commission. I mean, there is limitation mm. on, on hate speech and a whole lot of other things as well. Um, yeah. and, the, and the current race relations conciliator is doing a lot. And maybe this would be where the, it would be practical. And I haven't looked at this in detail in relation to the commercial world. But I think if you look at the um, Human Rights Commission website, yeah. you can download the recent program against racism that they've just released and that's open for consultation at the moment. And on our Network Waitangi website, there's a briefing paper on that program, which suggests, makes suggestions for things that could happen as a result of the release of that program. Mm. So if you look on the, on the Human Rights Commission website to get the um, program itself, and you like, might like to consider looking at the briefing paper that's on the Network Waitangi website, which comments on that paper. It's just, it's literally hot off the press. That might be raw material that could be useful. Yeah, thank you. I do wonder though that um, until we have um, Titiriti or Waitangi baked into policy, like for example, in order to incorporate a company in New Zealand, you have to agree to uphold um, or Waitangi. Um, until that happens, that's, I, I, I wonder if some people might argue that that's actually racist because it's, it's allowing companies to opt out. What's racist, sorry? The fact that um, companies can incorporate or can are not held to account at a governance level Oh, I see. Well, it'd be an interesting case to take to the, you could take it complaint mm -hmm. to the to the Human Rights Commission on that basis. Yeah, and I mean, that wasn't my idea, that was just uh, some, <laughs> some discussion that I came across on LinkedIn, yeah. which I thought was... I think, I think probably, right. you know, but we're at the stage where this is the work that needs to be done. We need to think about priorities and think about uh, the, the campaigns and things that we need to do because you know it won't happen unless some of us do it we have to like we some of us got together and wrote the briefing paper on the human rights commission program because somebody needed to start something not because we thought it was the final word but because we thought it would start the debate so I think this is the work that needs to be done Annie you had a question and then Miranda Could you unmute yourself, Annie? Sorry, thank you, Catherine. Um, my apologies, I came into this discussion extremely late in the piece. I've got my days mixed up and other things. But Catherine, I have a question, um, and, and I'm a bit rusty on it myself at the moment, but is there a need for some context to also be given and, and some information about the Declaration of Independence from 1835 as well as part of this, because that- yeah, We did that before you came in. Yeah, yeah. so I'm wondering about in, in this actual, these points that you're putting down, whether that yes. also needs to be in there? So basically, are you saying that it's not only the point that Rob made about 
the, the proper treaty, you know, the authoritative text of the treaty, that's one important thing. But there's also the pre-treaty story, and in particular, the profiling of the 1835 Declaration of Rangatiratanga. Yes, I think so. So the, pro, the, the pre-treaty story and the profiling of, because I think to, to put in just the 1835 Declaration without a bit of context, you know, about historical context, people don't really understand where it's coming from. They think it was the big white chief that came from Europe and saved the natives, you know. Yes. It, it isn't actually the case at all, that, that story. And it needs to be told properly. So the pre-treaty story with the 1835 statement and the authoritative text of the treaty. Those are three things, um, Kirsty, that we could perhaps highlight. Maybe, I don't know if you can make them in red or something, but those are three things that certainly seem to have emerged. And, and that this is, this is information that people need. Um, and they need to understand that from what you're saying, Rob, so that they actually feel the discipline of not of using it and not being racist. Mm. Thank you, thank you, Annie. Thank you, Miranda. Yeah, um, Annie and Kelly, you were having that conversation about workshops or understanding for public servants and so forth. You know that I I've been a public servant, and they give you workshops as part of your government related work. And I um, wonder why or how to make it more meaningful, because um, it definitely seems like a lot of box ticking. Oh, or, yes. Would you agree, Catherine? I would. <laughs> yes, yes. It definitely feels like a lot of box ticking. Mm. And, you know, we go to these things because, you know, we've been mandated to do so on a Wednesday morning um, and so forth. And, and it, it become, it's not meaningful. And so I think the challenge is to make those types of that that type of education more meaningful, whether it's at in work or at uni or at school. Um, and I think there were some comments in here about making it a part of everyday life, because the treaty is really valuable. It's got some really great, great things in it, just for living peacefully with your neighbour. Well, you I know? think that that's. I actually think that we often have heard. The, the even the articles you know separately referred to I sort of feel no not even the articles you've got to have the preamble mm. uh, because that was actually the the whole thing wouldn't have happened if that commitment to peace had not been accepted by both sides yes um, yes yes and, yes and that and that's that's the inheritance that 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 in some ways is a contribution too from from the the the, the crown side of events. You know, the the Queen Victoria was actually not that keen on sending Captain Hobson out here because she and her husband Albert were quite far think far forward thinking, and they knew what had gone on in Africa, and they were not happy about the role of British people there, and so. She was a no, we don't want to colonize any more countries. We've done that. It's not, not the, you know, no sort of story. She had to be persuaded because of the bad behavior of the commercial companies, taking your point, Rob. The New Zealand company had come out here um, and had, they'd sold off bits of New Zealand in England to British people. And British people arrived thinking they had title to these parts and they didn't. Uh, and and so that was really the thing that persuaded um, the the Home Office to write the instructions for Hob Hobson to come out here and form a treaty, because he was instructed by Lord, Lord Normanby, who wrote those instructions, to get the free and intelligent consent of Maori, and to recognise that Maori had title to the soil and to sovereignty. Those words are in Normanby's instructions. So those things are unequivocal. Elizabeth. Um, I was just going to touch on the fact that I have been trying to incorporate more um, te reo into my everyday life and you know such things, even as simple as just using it in an email and on social media posts. And when I was talking to other students, they were expressed, they were really scared to do that because there's this fear of keyboard warriors um, who get offended on behalf of other people. And I said, well, why don't you want to try and, you know, incorporate this into your life? And they were just 
yeah, too scared of the repercussions of somebody calling them a racist or um, adopting someone else's culture that they didn't even want to try. And that seriously needs to be addressed if that is happening. And that's where they need allies. That's where that idea of, I think it's really important for Tangata Tiriti to, to, to get together, to talk about being Tangata Tiriti. That's in, in every place, you ne we need to find each other and, and connect so that we can strengthen the possibility that we'll have a treaty-based future. Because the point that was made earlier is that Māori, in terms of majoritarianism thinking, Māori are a minority. But if in the non-Māori world, to use that term that I don't like using, <laughs> but if, if in the non-Māori world we become committed to this idea of a peaceful future, the treaty talks about a peaceful future where everybody was, is included and people's spirituality is cared for, everybody's. It talks about tangata whenua retaining what they always had, and that's a big job to restore that. But it also talks about a form of authority for people who are not Māori, provided they let Māori access that authority, that form of authority to get on with being an honourable kawanatanga. And so that idea of having an honourable governance alongside rangatiratanga is, is, a, is a really practical way forward because we're learning so much from the voices of tangata whenua in terms of a depreciation of kaitiaki tanga and even just greeting each other. You know, just whakapanoinga tanga happens in New Zealand meetings now. People do talk to each other. They don't just go in there and sit down and have a move a motion and leave. Um, so yeah, I think it's really encouraging. But we we have to, we actually have to talk to each other. That's the big thing, big one. We need to pull the threads together. I think. Um, That's right. We've got uh, a minute or two left. And I'll take these comments and I will feed something back to the powers that be. Is there any last minute comment that somebody would like to make? Yes, Helen. I just want to thank you, Catherine, for an inspiring. I'm a local government elected person and I'm in my fourth triennium. And I found a lot of the stuff that comes to us is if we're not responsible for doing our own research, all the information that comes to us comes with an unconscious bias. So I take on board what Rob has said about, um, I also chair the Women's Empowerment Principles, which works with um, local go or governments or um, companies up and down New Zealand that actually signed the principles of the women empowerment, which actually touches on some of the things that you're talking about, Rob. But I think it's important to have a handbook that we can do because language is something that we don't do properly. I've been on the negotiating floors in New York and Geneva, and I don't think we make the connections between what we're doing at local government or as NGOs around the sustainable development goals or the treaty. We're doing the work, but we're actually not telling that story that we're doing it and that we're doing it well. Well, but we thank should, you for the conversation. We pick this up and we will. And I think Nanaya Mahuta offered the CSOs, the civil society organizations an opportunity too. Yeah. So I think Helen, we might have not have time for any more questions, yeah. but please, you've all got my email. Um, if, if you're, could we just go back to the screen briefly, yes, please. Kirsty? Yes. to the thank you love uh, and the powerpoint presentation which is, is it? oh i need to share my screen don't i that's what i <laughs> okay so just going back to the beginning there's my email please email if you want a copy of the of the presentation or if you want anything at all there it is there, organizers at nwo.org.nz. Have a good snoop at the website because you can probably find stuff that you want. Let us know if there's any way we can support you. And I'll put some words together and at least give some feedback from this session, Kirsty, with your help.